Okay, let's just take a moment and ask for the Lord's help in this last ministry session. Our Father, we're thankful today for our blessings, all that we enjoy in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our hearts have been touched today as we have listened to brothers share from the Word of God, and we are just thankful for the greatness um, of thy love and thy care for us, the philanthropic love that has been displayed to such unworthy recipients. And Father, may we know what it is to uh, live triumphant lives with our trust in thee. And Father, as we think of the gospel, we pray for the meetings in uh, Vancouver just now, and the meeting starting in Brampton, and we pray for the meeting starting tomorrow night in thy will in St. John's. We look to thee for a harvest of precious souls. This is not something that any of us can achieve ourselves. We are entirely dependent upon the working of the Holy Spirit, and so we pray for blessing in these efforts and many other efforts. And for thy saints who are in need and distress, we commend them to thee. And for our families and loved ones in Christ and out of Christ, we commit them to thee. And just help us now as we open the word of God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to share a, a few more thoughts in this session on the Christian's inner cheerfulness, the calm delight of the heart of a believer that's enjoying the Lord. That was what I tried to deal with this morning. I'm not going to go over the ground this morning, but here's a question for myself and for you. Do I have an inner island of bright tranquility? Do I experience the joy that Jesus prayed that I would have? What would you? Do I have the inner cheerfulness that marks one who walks with God? An inner calm delight in the midst of dark and disappointing clouds of life? Has the appearance of the, the risen Christ, as I read the scriptures, has it had the same effect on me as it had on the discouraged two in the road to Emmaus that we're hearing about? Your child of God, the word of God assures us that there is a unique joy that comes from intimacy with Christ. Conferences like this, and we're thankful to the Christians in St. John's. I was looking at all those pictures of all your different events, and I didn't know many of the believers. I haven't spent that much time in your beautiful province. My father did. Um, but I did recognize quite a few who are still with us today. Some are a little bit older. And then I saw some who were with the Lord. And that's, that's amazing, too. And so we're appreciative of this conference. And, but you know, all the conferences and all the meetings and being with other believers, it's all wonderful and it's all a part of fellowship. We need each other. But there is absolutely no substitute for the joy that comes from being alone with him. This morning, I tried to differentiate between the effervescence of positive developments in our lives, the good news, the breakthroughs, the difference between excitement and the thrill of circumstances and the deep-seated inner joy of a Christian who is walking with God. Are you walking with God as you head into November? So this morning, we tried to look at the echo of heaven and um, the evidence of communion. The outcome of communion is joy, and that's inner joy. And I want to think some more about joy and the calm delight of a soul who's experiencing communion with the Lord. 
And then after a little bit more on that, we'll talk about the energy. Joy is the energy for service. And joy should be the experience. Well, it is the experience of a healthy assembly. And joy is essential to gospel testimony. But first, let's go back a little bit to the evidence of communion. Inner cheerfulness. Calm, the light of soul. It is a direct result of communion with the Lord. It cannot be experienced any other way. So I want you to open your Bible just now to... Habakkuk in the Old Testament, or Habakkuk, however you want to say it, Habakkuk chapter 3. We're going to read a beautiful verse, but the prophet didn't, certainly didn't start off with these words, these beautiful words. He ended with these words after he worked through his bitterness, and after he got Worked through his anger and his misgivings about God. Yes, misgivings about God. And he did it. He worked it all through in the presence of God. In communion with God. And those hours alone with the almighty God. Look at, well, look at it. Habakkuk chapter three. You probably can quote it by memory. I can't. You may have it on your wall. Verse 17. This is how that whole experience of Habakkuk evolved to this point. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive tree may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. What's it say? If you were working from a good version of the Bible, it'll say, yet, words to this effect, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. See, I don't know when you've last read this little book, but it starts off, Habakkuk is telling God how to run his universe. <laughs> Do you ever get in that kind of a, a mindset? And it ends up with just a simple but beautiful trust and confidence in God. You see, the prop, prophet couldn't understand God and what he was allowing. That's chapter one. It says, like, in other words, he's saying, if you read chapter one carefully, Lord, I am getting the sense that my cries to you are falling on deaf ears. You're not listening, Lord. You're not responding. You're not intervening. You're doing nothing to stop the evil. You're tolerating it. Why, Lord? Ever have alone time with God? in that type of a communion? Have you ever wondered why God seems indifferent to your concerns? Habakkuk is basically wrestling with something that we wrestle with today. Why aren't things fair, God? Why don't you intervene? You ever have a heart-to-heart -heart communications with the Lord like that? I know you do. Just when your heart was so utterly burdened and heavy, have you fallen to your knees and just cried out to God and asked him the tough questions? That's communion with the Lord. Habakkuk did. And as he poured out his heart to the Lord, things changed or no 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 sorry things didn't change he changed that's what happens to us in the presence of the lord we change habakkuk's circumstances hadn't changed he changed oh that's why i need communion with the lord 
Habakkuk starts the little book by lodging his dark complaint with God, and he ends with a prayer and praise poem. You ever read the lyrics? I call them lyrics because I think if you look at it carefully, he thinks that this poem that he's just written should be sung by the congregation and accompanied by the Philharmonic Orchestra. Something like that. His inner joy, it's so reverberated in the chambers of his heart after this little talk with God. Ah, he wrote that beautiful poem. Such was his exuberant joy as he communed with God. It was like he came alive. You know, I was into, I better not get derailed here with a little side story, but Doug McLeod is a respected overseer in PEI and in the Maritimes, and he had the really serious heart condition and he's in his late 80s and I went to visit him while he was waiting for a heart valve replacement this last month and he just had it a few days ago but I went into Charlottetown and I, I, I sat down with Doug I thought I would see some frail you know his heart palpitations and well I got on I went in there and look he grabbed his bible like this and I was going to say Doug just you're too excited you're too excited. Well, he just, he, he, he said, oh, Peter, look at, I'm just enjoying this. Luke 23, look, 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 and he got his big heavy Bible up and he was sitting on the bed and he was going back and forth. And he said, the thief on the cross, just think of it, Peter. Look, you hear, he said, people at the cross, they were probably saying, oh no, today he can't be in paradise with God. He's not baptized. And he was, his voice was elevated and his face was beaming. And he said, he never went to our synagogue. He can't go to paradise. Oh, but the Lord said, Peter, isn't that wonderful? And I was getting a little embarrassed because there was somebody in the next bed. And I thought, there's a dear saint of God who's been through the storms of life. And now he goes through these really weak spells and he's waiting for a heart valve replacement. And he's enjoying the Lord. Habakkuk was enjoying the Lord. And then as he worked those things through with the Lord in communion with him, he said, Lord, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive, may fail and the fields yield no food though the flock may be cut off in the fold and there be no herd in the stalls yet i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation you know i was playing around with a, a freer paraphrase of that in today's parlance though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen. Though the baked apples in Newfoundland are worm-eaten and the offshore oil production is plummeting. Though the cod stocks are depleted and job opportunities are evaporating and friction among the Christians is brewing and loved ones aren't saved. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. So often we just repeat verse 17 and verse 18 of Habakkuk 3, where we stop at, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh. I will joy in the God alone of my salvation. But look at verse 19. The Lord God Adonai is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Who does it? Alone in the presence of God, he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon mine high places. Oh, what a perspective change for Habakkuk. And the joy that flooded us, I will rejoice in my certain. No, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk's inner joy, it just so reverberated in the chambers of his heart. He wanted that poem to be beautifully, wanted a beautiful rendition of it, sung by the congregation and accompanied by the 
London Philharmonic Orchestra. Such was his joy as he communed with his God. They said it was like he came alive. Joy is a definite evidence of communion with the Lord. Lack of it is evidence that maybe Peter needs to walk more closely with the Lord. I'm speaking to many of you who know all about entering into the Lord's presence with tears and with heavy hearts and afterwards emerging with confidence and maybe through your blinding tears, a little song of praise to the Lord. How is your fellowship with Christ today? Do I know him better in 2021 than I did in 2020 when the pandemic began? The psalmist said in Psalm 43, I will go to the altar of God unto God, what? My exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God, my God. The psalmist was writing down a devotional thought. He told God that you're, you are my greatest joy, God. You are my ultimate joy. Oh, it's a, we, tell, we tell sinners that it's a real relationship, real communion. We can wax eloquent from the pulpit trying to whet the appetite of the unconverted. But is it vibrant? Is it robust? Is it occurring in my life and yours? This St. John's conference would be noteworthy for the eternal ages if just one Christian, maybe you, was drawn closer to the Lord in communion and experienced that calm delight of aloneness with him. Do you have those long talks with God? Or those frequent little short talks with him? A little talk with Jesus? I was uh, just listening to a, a, a song this morning, early this morning, Cleveland Derricks, an African-American pastor. He wrote these words in 1937, and this hymn has been sung by so many in four-part harmony, bass and all the rest. I listened to this, I listened to Larry Ford and J.D. Sumner singing it. Now, I know some of you aren't into Southern gospel. You're into contemporary worship songs. That's good there. But I once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. He bathed my heart in love. He wrote my name above. And just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Then the next stanza says, I may have doubts and fears. My eyes be filled with tears. But Jesus is a friend who watches day and night. I go to him in prayer. He knows my every care. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. And then J.D. Sumner comes in. Now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by. Yes, joy is the echo of heaven and calm delight is the evidence of communion, walking and talking with God. But joy is also the energy for service. We've been going through the epistles of John in our, our weekly Bible readings in Summerside, and the very person of Christ was under attack by some who were doing their best to infiltrate the assemblies. And not only did John confront the heresy, he said he was writing that their and his joy, their joy and his joy would be full and complete. The Christians John was writing had very little energy to go on. Friction saps the energy and negativity cripples the vitality of believers individually. Trials and disappointments, they do take their toll too. So why is it we know believers who have every reason to be discouraged? Yet they are busily engaged in the service of the Lord in serving others. If there was no inner joy from communion with the Lord, it would be impossible. They would crash quickly. Paul himself, he had his share of afflictions. Dear child of God, 
the source and the foundation of a Christian's joy. It's not the absence of pain or the freedom from struggles. No. And it's not just the temporary celebration of good news. The joy that comes from intimacy with Christ doesn't depend on the elimination of things that weigh us down. Wonderful when those things are lifted. The joy comes from knowing that in this sad old world, we can be in touch with God who has given us eternal life in Christ. That's where our joy come from, comes from. Our joy comes from experiencing the presence of God in our lives. Am I speaking to a discouraged Sunday school teacher? Or maybe a disheartened overseer? Or a disillusioned preacher? Or maybe a despondent parent and your energy's gone? The fire of your passion for the things of God and the gospel, the wick is flickering badly. Someone feels that they just don't have the energy to be a faithful believer any longer. No energy. Well, Habakkuk, read some of David's Psalms. What about Paul? Paul had his shipwrecks. Paul had his beatings, starvings rejections, children in the faith who turned against him. Yes, his own converts taking sides against him, others disrupting the unity in the local churches he had seen planted. Paul, where do you get your energy to go on? You know what he says in Acts 20, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I may Finish my course with what? Joy. Isn't that amazing? All of those things. And yet he's focused, I want to finish my pathway with God with joy. Colossians 1 verse 10 perhaps gives us a little bit of insight into where that comes from. He says, Paul writes that ye may, might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering. And then he said, with joyfulness, long suffering, endurance. How many years have you been waiting? Long suffering, he said, with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. Joy is the energizer for your service. When a Christian loses their joy, things begin to sort of unravel and sour, and her spiritual energy fades. Sometimes it really fades, doesn't it? Well, I just want you to think of that. Joy is the, gives us the energy for service. But joy is also the experience of a healthy assembly life. Yes, there is inner joy and calm delight in communion with Christ and abiding in the vine. But that is not to say that experiencing joy from the circumstances is not important. When you read the epistles, you get the very distinct impression that the apostles looked forward to good news for which they could rejoice. Paul, he, he longed to see Timothy. So he said, I'm, I want to see him so bad so I can be filled with what? Joy. Yeah, just seeing another brother. John derived joy when he saw other Christians walking in the truth. Joy should be the experience of healthy assembly life. Joy should be the atmosphere cultivated and cherished by all in a local assembly. It should be led by the oversight itself. Joy. Um, I 
helped on the oversight for maybe a decade. Um, I was fairly young. Now I'm sort of thankful that I'm not an overseer. There's a lot of delicate things to deal with and quite a balancing act. But, you know, overseers have a huge responsibility in tending to the culture and the atmosphere of assembly life. Yes, individuals who are causing you to stay awake at night, they will have to give an account of themselves. But as an overseer, I am responsible for the atmosphere of assembly life. The absence of joy in an assembly should not be dismissed by throwing your hands up and saying, if we have joy, that's great. If we don't, there's nothing wrong with just old, tough, old being a plotter. Grin and bear it. It's the way we did it years ago. Joy's not all that critical in the grander eternal scheme of things. Joy. It's just a feeling. Feelings come and go. I don't think I'm speaking to any overseers this afternoon that have that attitude. But you're right. Joy is a feeling. It's definitely a feeling, but it's also a state. Did I hear someone uh, maybe downplaying the need for the soft stuff like joy, vitality, happiness? And you're thinking in your mind, that's all secondary? Hardcore Christianity is persevering and preserving the truth. The truth. But if that's all we're getting, and it is obviously, preserving the truth. But if that's all we're getting from our Bibles, we are missing a lot. Plus, we are unbalanced. I think we all know that truth and doctrine can be held can be adhered to with a cold iron fist. Joy told me the other Sunday night after I spoke in the gospel, she said, did you realize that you're clenching your fist quite a bit when you're preaching? Well, sorry about that. Clenched fists don't, don't look good, do they? But we know that we can hold truth with a clenched fist without any love or joy, cold. And I think that's what's beautiful about how Paul and others present doctrinal truth. The truth they present and the outcome they expect is just, if this is a doctrine, it'll produce more grace, more compassion, more humility, more love, more joy as we live out the doctrine. That's how they presented it. Do we present it that way? I noticed this yesterday. Paul told the believers in Corinth that when he corrected them and taught them, yes, Corinth, there are a lot of problems. He said, I'm not trying to dominate over, over you or lord it over you. This is 2 Corinthians 1, verse 24. He said, we are working with you. We are helpers of what? We are helpers of your joy. It just is like jumped out the page. That's what we're doing. Helpers of your joy. And we can be critical of Christians who are discontented, going through a rough time, maybe unhappy. Maybe they're looking for their field for fellowship elsewhere. We could be somewhat dismissive of their pursuit of joy. We could tell them, and I think maybe I've said this myself. Look, brother, it's not about you. It's about him. It's not about whether you have joy or not. It's not about whether he, it's, it's all about whether he is getting joy. If his heart is deriving delight from us. Sometimes we say such truisms rather simplistically. They sound profound, but often they are simplistic. Sometimes it is easier to say stuff like that and blame them rather than deal with the bigger issue or treating the root causes of the atmosphere in the assembly. God expects us to, yes, to defend the truth and uphold the truth, but there's something that he's not pleased with. He's not pleased with grumpy guardians of the truth or acerbic defenders of the faith or solemn truth holders. He's not pleased with that. He expects us to be joyful through our lives and through the vicissitudes of life. Joy is essential. Joy is foundational to effective personal living, personal assembly life. When it's missing in either place, at home or in the assembly, it's cause for grave concern, personally, corporately. The local churches dotting the globe are meant to be not only the pillar in the ground of the 
truth, but the actual close-knit community of believers whose common life is their shared experience of Christ. That's what the fellowship is supposed to be. The joy of the Bible is not a superficial, effervescent, spine-tingling, uh, momentary flash or thrill, but neither is it a dull, unexpressive type of emotion. It flows over and affects others. Not just about giving out hymns and public praying and preaching and public teaching. It's to be a real fellowship where people talked about Christ and not just in the formal sessions of the church, vibrant, where people, they share their experiences with God to encourage one another. In the midst of a hostile world, they, those early Christians, they prayed together, supported each other, carried each other's burdens. There was to be an expression of love. The frequent references to love in John's epistles and in the upper room ministry of the Lord we're not just pie in the sky dreams. Being joyful is a command repeated more than once in the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 5, rejoice and be glad. It's a command. Paul said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Philippians 4, verse 4. Joy is to be the experience of the local assembly. And if it's not, then that assembly is struggling. John wanted the readers of his letter his epistles to have joy and have their joy would it would be his too and that joy would be filled brimful if they were firmly established in the christian faith and the doctrine and the fellowship that's in his epistles probably thinking back and ringing in his ears was were the words that jesus spoke in the upper room about joy energy for service it should be the experience of healthy assembly life, and one final one, and then I'm finished. Joy is the essential for gospel testimony. Think of the, think of the impact of the joyful prisoners in Philippi as they sang the night away. Imagine what it would have been like if Paul and Silas were just like all the other prisoners in there against their will. One of the very sad outcomes of the pandemic, a very sad outcome for the Christian faith is a stain of collective testimony of Christianity, how the world perceives Christian testimony. So much news coverage was given to professing Christians shouting, waving their fists, holding their placards, wearing their I love Jesus t-shirts, waving their Bibles as they shouted defiance and resistance and rebellion for public health measures, defiant pastors being handcuffed and going to jail, not for persecution for the cause of Christ, absolutely not, but for non-compliance with basic health protection measures during a deadly pandemic. Facebook was littered with nastiness and weirdness from people who posted Bible verses. Where was their humility? Where was their joy? Where were their smiles of delighting in Christian, delighting in Christ in the midst of a turbulent pandemic? 775,000 deaths between Canada and the United States in the last almost 20 months died to COVID. Oh, you say they weren't all COVID deaths. Um, if you had a son that was battling cancer and he seemed to be starting to respond to the treatment and you were so hopeful and then he got COVID, would you say, oh, he died with cancer? Or would you say, COVID took him? Oh, I hate COVID. It's easy to dismiss 775,000 deaths. Dear child of God, how am I behaving at this time? Am I reflecting the joys of communion with Christ? Instead of being a blessing in the community, it seems like some out there have acted as shown that Christianity is a menace to society. They're objecting to public health measures. It's like a cancer in society. They're trying to save lives, minimize deaths from deadly virus. Now, probably none of us here listening today have engaged in causing such a blight in their testimony, but dear child of God, 
I think damage has been done to a Christian testimony in North America in historic proportions. Don't be surprised if the collective behavior of those under the big evangelical umbrella will be used against us to curtail our freedoms in the future, and we won't be able to blame it on the offense of the cross. We'll blame it on those who took the name of Christ and acted unwisely. Such poor, unchristlike, unjoyful, defiant behavior will expedite the erosion of the privileges, not our rights, the privileges that we have taken for granted as Christians up until now. Individually, let this conference be a reminder to all that there's nothing more powerful in gospel testimony than joyful, humble Christians who love each other and whose love embraces all the philanthropic love that Mike has been talking about of God. That's what should be emanating from our own lives on Facebook, Instagram. Dear child of God, joy is the envy of the world. William Shatner for decades has been open about his inner loneliness. Brad Pitt has talked about congenital sadness. I was born with sadness, but the joy that Jesus gives and what he talked about and what the apostles taught was a spiritual joy that springs from communion with Christ, the springs of living water. You're burdened about the gospel. Is your joy so real? and so radiant that those who know you would love to have what you have. Someone has said that if Christ is just doctrine to us, our testimony will be hollow. If Christ is a real person in our lives, our testimony will be potent. So let me conclude. I just want to use the words of the Apostle Peter when he talked about the trials of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And then he said, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing you what? Rejoice with what? Joy, unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. God bless all of you and help all of us.